Welcome back to WGN TV Political Report. It's been one month since Mike Madigan's 35 year reign as Speaker of the Illinois House ended. And already his successor, Speaker Chris Welch, is trying to chart a new path forward. This week, lawmakers voted to adopt new rules for the way business is conducted in the House. They include a 10 year term limit on legislative leaders, the ability to hold remote hearings during the pandemic, also small changes to how proposed bills make their way to the House floor. Republicans argue their bills will still get stuck in committees that are controlled by Democrats, and Democrats say, hey, elections have consequences. Protecting those people and their values as voters sit the majority of this chamber to do is not controlling the process. It is the fundamental responsibility of a representative body. Now, by the way, this Wednesday, Governor Pritzker will give his budget address nearly one year after COVID began ravaging the state's finances. But the Pritzker administration says the state's deficit going to be around $3 billion, nearly half of what was originally projected. Even after his graduated tax amendment failed, the governor says he will not raise income taxes this year. His budget plan will also keep spending at the same level as last year. No cuts, no increases. Pritzker's relying on the legislature to close corporate tax loop polls that could net the state $900 million. Some federal funds will be passed on to schools. State Representative Tom Demmer is a Republican whose district covers parts of northwestern Illinois. He serves as deputy Republican leader in the Illinois House. Joining us live this morning on this Valentine's Day. Representative, I appreciate your being with me. Are you happy with the governor's plan? No tax increases. That's music to the ears of Republicans. Well, that's certainly the right place to start with a budget year. You know, you should always start your budgeting process by understanding how much money is available and then look at your spending priorities and see how those two fit together. For many years in Springfield, we've heard a tax first approach from uh, Democrats who would control the House, the Senate and the governor's office. And this year, at least we're starting with the, the idea that uh, tax increases aren't always the first place we should look. We just have to have the discipline to hold to that through the budgeting process. So the budget deficit, which I said, is estimated to be $3 billion. It was supposed to be 5.5. Remember when the graduated income tax failed? And just before that, we were warned by the lieutenant governor, among others, your taxes are going up probably 20%, a full 1%, you know, for, uh, in terms of the payment. And that's not happening. So who do you give? Do you give Democrats and Governor Pritzker credit for keeping things limited so that we don't see these increases? I give credit to the voters. I think one of the strongest messages that came out of the November election is that the people of Illinois don't want another income tax increase. Um, they spoke pretty strongly against the, the graduated income tax amendment that was on the ballot. And I think with a lot of folks, the thinking was, you know, not about the nuts and bolts of any specific proposal. It was more, hey, look, you can't just keep coming back for tax after tax after tax. You've got to get serious about balancing the budget and doing so through some of the difficult decisions that come uh, looking at the expense side of things. So now that we're seeing some of the unpopular proposals being taken off the table, like, in, you know, uh, taxing uh, uh, retirement revenue, that kind of thing. Um, look, you're one of the leads in budget negotiations from the Republican side. What can be done uh, to make sure things move copacetically and there is as little pain as possible going forward? Well, you know, one of the first things that we've asked the governor's office for several times is in the past two years, in each year, they've asked their agency directors and department heads to assemble a list of um, ways that they could reduce spending within their departments. And so, you know, the, those are the people who know those budgets best. They live with them every single day. We want to have uh, in the House and in the Senate convene budget hearings, bring in those agency leaders, ask them about where they see opportunities in their budget. And then as legislators, we have to sort of make those pieces fit together. But I think the first step in this is bringing those folks forward, having uh, public hearings. Now in the House, we're able to do those hearings remotely. Uh, we should convene those budget hearings as soon as possible and hear directly from the people who are responsible for carrying out their budgets. You know, under the Trump administration, the there wasn't going to be any money for, to state and local governments. And under the Biden administration, it appears that $13.2 billion will be making its way to Illinois. A lot of people thought that money was going to be used to close the deficit. And um, the governor's mansion or office kind of clarified, no, no, we're not, that's not what we're doing with the money. So if we're not closing the deficit with over $13 billion from the feds, assuming we get it, what do we do with it? 
Well, first, I think it's important that we, we shouldn't spend those dollars until we actually know we have them. Uh, one of the longer running issues, I think, with the Pritzker administration is that they built budget after budget on hypothetical revenue. Uh, we really cannot be in a position of uh, hoping that money comes in or hoping that something changes and we're able to spend more. Uh, we've got a budget based on the, the current reality and then sort of cross that bridge when, when it, we come to it. The other important thing, I think, to consider with this COVID relief package that's being debated in Washington. Washington, is we need to re remember and recognize the significant financial burden that COVID has put on small businesses, on employees of those businesses, um, on many of the local organizations uh, who have been hit very strongly uh, by the by the shutdowns uh, and COVID-related uh, circumstances. And we need to consider, look, it's not just the state budget that needs to be patched up, it's also uh, many of those budgets. And so we should look to provide relief and to pass on relief uh, to the people of Illinois who have uh, suffered through this process as well. You know, as uh, uh, things move forward, obviously Republicans want a voice. One of the things Speaker Welch has said is that I'm going to keep reaching out to Republicans even if they keep slapping my hand down. Is that a truthful statement? I mean, is he slapping down the hand of Republicans? Well, look, uh, we uh, look for example. I'm sorry, the I should say it's Republicans. He's saying, I want to clarify that. He said Republicans keep slapping down his hand. I want to be clear. Sorry. Right, right. So look at the only legislative action that we've taken so far, which is to pass the House rules. Uh, in that process, the House Republicans made many, many suggestions, uh, specifically around improving transparency, allowing more voices to be part of the product, the product, and closing some of those um, rules that allowed for you know, these, these notorious midnight amendments or, you know, 500 page amendments that get dropped and voted on an hour later, all of those things are still permitted under the House rules. So when we look at, you know, the, the idea of extending our hand across the aisle, we're trying to do so. We gave specific recommendations and suggestions about how to make the House rules better, not just for people in the legislature, but for the general public. Uh, and really none of those suggestions were included in the rules package that went forward. So we'll certainly continue to offer suggestions for how to make things um, more above board, more transparent and more collaborative and uh, continue to look for Speaker Welch um, to, to take some decisions that match some of the rhetoric that we hear about, oh, this is a new day, we're turning a new page. It's hard to see that connection when the House rules that were passed you know, are 99% the same word for word as they've been in previous years. Well, I would think one good thing that you'd be happy with is that there are now limits on the, the terms for leadership, including the Speaker. Ten Ten years. That's got to be a good thing for you guys, right? Yeah, I think that's a positive step. You know, the Senate had done term limits before. You know, House Republicans and our own caucus bylaws had put in term limits before. And so I'm glad that the House Democrats have joined the rest of the Capitol in acknowledging that that's probably a good step. I know when we talk about, with just about 20 seconds left, I know when we talk about the rules is kind of in the weeds, but the bottom line is that a lot of bills which ordinarily went to die in what's called the Rules Committee get to go to other committees. That's also a decent thing? Uh, that's similar to a rule that was in place under Madigan uh, prior to 2013. And so, you know, we want, really want to see additional safeguards to know that at any point in the process, one person can't unilaterally yeah. kill a bill that has support from other legislators. Okay. All right. Representative Tom Demmer, thank you, sir, for your time. Appreciate it. Enjoy your Sunday. Thanks, Paul.